Today we will be discussing political parties in the United States from 1796 to the present. The most important thing you should know is that America has a two-party system. Most other democracies in the world have multi-party democracies, meaning that there are many different political parties with many different viewpoints, and they come together to form coalitions uh, where they agree on certain topics and they disagree on others, but they unite politically to be able to govern. We do not have that in America. We have two parties going all the way back to the beginning of the Republic. And even though the names of those parties have changed, they have shared some basic concepts ideologically over 230 years. So we will now look at the first party system, which existed from 1789 until the late 1810s. The first political party in America were the Federalists, and the Federalists quite simply believed in the United States Constitution. And so everybody involved in the early days of American government, or at least under the current government, um, were Federalists. The anti-Federalists, the people who were opposed to the implementation of the United States Constitution, never entered government. So the Federalists all advocated for a fairly strong national government. The Federalists put two presidents into the White House. In fact, the first two presidents, Washington and John Adams. Uh, eventually, you have a break uh, around 1796, in fact, uh, over whether or not the federal government was going to run a national bank. The person who was trying to establish a national bank is the person who is pictured on the slide, Alexander Hamilton, who was never a president, but he was a very, very uh, close advisor of President Washington going all the way back to the Revolutionary War. He was not friends with John Adams, though. Uh, so he wanted to establish this national bank for a lot of different reasons. Um, the main reason being that it would force the states to become more unified. And as a very strong federalist, that was something that he was very, very interested in doing. Uh, as a result of that, though, a faction of federalists broke away because they, while they favored a strong national government in principle, they felt that uh, establishing a national bank would make the federal government too strong relative to the states. And so that group gives itself a different name, and the name that they choose uh, is the Democratic Republicans. Now, obviously, that is a very confusing name for a political party in the era in which we live, since the names of our two main political parties uh, are the Democrats and the Republicans. The Democratic Republicans will eventually evolve into the Democratic Party, and the Republican Party comes along much, much later. Uh, but the Federalists are basically gone by the uh, 1820s. So the Democratic Republicans, they were early on, they were also Federalists. They believed in the implementation of the Constitution. But Whereas the Federalists desired to have a very strong central government, the Democratic Republicans wanted that federal government to be more limited. This was the dominant political party in the Mid-Atlantic and the Deep South. So basically everything south of New York City, it was the Democratic Republicans that were the dominant political party. And the Democratic Republicans, this is prior to them becoming the Democratic Party, uh, they uh, were represented by Presidents Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, and John Quincy Adams, who was the son of President John Adams. And we refer to this period in the late 1810s and early 1820s as, quote, the era of good feelings because there weren't any opposing political parties. So yes, we have had a two-party system for virtually the entire existence of the Republic, except for this 10-year period in which there is effectively only the Democratic Republican Party. So prior to the 1828 presidential elections, presidential candidates would stand for office. 
rather than run for office. Running for office is the term that is is the only term that's really used anymore. Um, but when when people would stand for office, they would they would stand up quite literally in in usually in the Congress and say, "I'm running for president." But they didn't campaign. They didn't go out into the country and try to uh, convince people to vote for them. They simply stood up. Thomas Jefferson stands up in 1896 and says, I am running for president. If you think I would be a good president, you should vote for me. If you think John Adams would be a good president, you should vote for him. And that's pretty much it. Starting in 1828, that changes, though, because the person who wins that election, Andrew Jackson, uh, runs for office. And so things that we sort of accept as being a standard part of running for political office, things like posters, which then, of course, evolve into campaign ads on first radio and then television. But we're starting with posters. And you can see one of those posters in the upper right hand corner. So you have posters, you have campaign rallies. Um, once uh, railroads continue to spread, they would have these tours where the president would be in the caboose of a train and the train would pull into a station in some town and the candidate would come and stand on the back of the caboose and give his speech. And, you know, crowds of people would be standing around listening to him and then they'd start the train up and they'd go on to the next town and do the same thing. So they had posters, they had campaign rallies, you know, jokes about kissing babies and telling lies. That all comes in for the first time, maybe not the lie part, but that all comes in for the first time in 1828. Now, this new party that Jackson represents, which he refers to as simply as the democracy, that does evolve out of the Democratic Republican Party. And the democracy is supported by a pretty wide range of voters. You have planters in the South, you have workers in the North, and you have small farmers kind of throughout uh, the country outside of New England. Um, a part of the reason why Jackson got elected, though, is because in the 1820s, uh, America goes from really only allowing wealthy white men with property to vote to allowing any white male to vote. And so by 1830, in most states, any white man could vote, regardless of whether or not they own property. Um, and so once you expand the voting franchise, you expand who gets elected, you know, and we see this in the early 20th century as well. As soon as you give women the right to vote, different candidates start winning elections. Uh, and so that that's very important. Uh, one of the things that's happening in America today right now in certain parts of the country is the effort to suppress the vote of various groups of people, largely ethnic groups, because if you limit people's right to vote, then you're also going to change who gets elected. Um, and the election was largely won by voters who lived west of the Appalachian Mountains. So in some of the newer states like Ohio and Kentucky and Tennessee, and Jackson was actually from that region of the country. He is the first American president who was born inside the United States of America and not an English colony. So that's also another change in the electorate is now the electorate is largely composed of people who don't remember the Revolutionary War. Uh, eventually, in the 1830s, the democracy changes its name to the Democratic Party. So after the 1830s or in the late 1830s, we move on to the second party system. Now, the Democratic Party still exists, but the second party system is defined by the rise of the Whig Party. Whig has nothing to do with the thing you put on your head. This is a reference to an old political movement in England. So they just took that name and gave them their own political party of that name based upon this English opposition party. Um, the Whig Party was the elite party. Uh, so the Working Man's Party was the Democratic Party uh, that includes small farmers west of the Appalachians down south. Um, and so the elitist party truly represents northern industrialists, not workers, but the actual industrialists themselves, along with bankers 
and along with Southern plantation owners. So your first question might be, well, this is a very small group of people. How could they possibly win an election? Well, this is what political campaigns are about. Uh, if you distill the message of various modern political parties, you would see that there is a political party that is most definitely the party of elites, but that party is very effective at convincing certain core demographic groups of Americans that those groups of people actually have their interests at heart. Um, the Whig Party was divided on the issue of slavery, as you might expect when you have northern industrialists and southern plantation owners. Um, uh, however, in addition to having slave owners in the South being a part of the Whig Party, you also have the abolitionist movement growing out of the Whig Party. So that's a contradiction. And that is also part of the reason why this party only exists for 20 years, uh, effectively. Um, they were also, not only were they divided on the issue of slavery, but they were also divided on the issue of westward expansion. How big geographically should the country get? Um, they did only win three presidential elections, and they none of those uh, presidents, those Whig presidents, were really all that notable. Uh, sadly, the greatest figure of that party, uh, he ran for president five times and he never won. Uh, hashtag sad. So let's look at the Democratic Party in a little bit more detail, and specifically the pre-Civil War Democratic Party, because the Democratic Party does go through a few evolutions over the course of history. So this really was the party of the South, and to a lesser degree, the party of the West. Um, eventually, plantation owners abandoned the Whig Party because the Whig Party was slowly getting more and more opposed to slavery. Uh, and this contributes to the collapse of the Whig Party. Um, the Democratic Party was very opposed to any limitations on slavery and any limitations on the expansion of slavery into Western territories. Uh, they were also the expansionist party. They were the ones that advocated for war with Mexico, the Mexican-American War. They are the ones that advocated for the uh, Gadsden Purchase, which is what allowed the expansion of the railroad into California. Uh, in the 1860 election, though, the Democratic Party actually split into a Northern Democratic faction and a Southern Democratic faction. And this split had to do with the issue of slavery. The Northern Democrats had no problem at all with the institution of slavery. They just didn't think that it should expand into all of the Western territories, whereas the Southern Democrats wanted it to be uh, the rule of law everywhere in America, not just in the South. And ultimately, both halves of the Democratic Party lost uh, the 1860 election to Abraham Lincoln. So we're moving now into the third party system. And technically, we still exist here in 2020 in the third party system. However, we're also living through a period of time where the party ideologies are shifting again. So it's unclear whether or not the third party system might actually be coming to an end in the era in which we are living. So the defining element of the third party system is the birth of the Republican Party, which forms out of the collapse of the Whig Party in the 1850s, it is mainly the party of the northern states. However, a lot of working class people and immigrants in the north did remain loyal to the Democratic Party. Uh, it was opposed, the Republican Party was opposed to slavery, at least in concept, but it was explicitly against the expansion of slavery into any of the western territories, anything on the western side of the Mississippi River other than Texas and Missouri. Uh, it was a pro-business party. That is one way in which the modern Republican Party is very similar to the political party of the 1850s. It is pro-business. Um, they were the dominant political party during Reconstruction. Reconstruction is the period in which the Southern states were occupied by the U.S. Army and forced to uh, give civil rights to former slaves. They were the political party that pushed through the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, which ended slavery and 
gave at least some civil rights on paper to former slaves. The reality, though, is that those rights are not actually given truly until the 1960s, 100 years after the end of the Civil War. Uh, the Republican Party dominated national politics until the end of Reconstruction in the 1870s, and yet still only one Democrat became president between 1876 and 1916. So the Democrats were very much in the wilderness during this period, and that has a large degree due to the fact that they were on the losing side of the Civil War. Confusingly, the younger of the two major political parties is referred to as the Grand Old Party. So if you ever hear people referring to the GOP, that is the Republican Party. So the 1860 election was one of the most consequential elections in American history, uh, perhaps until 2020, the most consequential election in American history. As we said in a previous slide, the Democrats were split. And so the Northern Democrats nominated a man named Stephen Douglas, and the Southern Democrats nominated someone named John Breckinridge. The Republican Party nominated Abraham Lincoln, and a third party nominated a man named John Bell. Now, that was the Constitutional Union Party. And whereas the Republican Party didn't explicitly want to ab abolish slavery, but they didn't want it to expand. And the, Demo the Democrats split into two groups. The Constitutional Union Party said, the only thing that matters to us is union, is making sure that we can keep the country together. That was their message. And that message was enough for, for that candidate to actually win three states in the election. No candidate got a majority of the vote, um, of the popular vote, but Lincoln easily won the Electoral College. And we know even into the present day that sometimes there is is there are different results between the popular vote and the Electoral College win. And if you had any questions about that, feel free to ask President Hillary Clinton about it. Now, several weeks after this election, nine southern states seceded from the Union, and that was the thing that sparked the Civil War. So the Southern Democrats being whiny about the fact that they lost an election is the reason why we had a Civil War. So again, that's another one that you might want to think about in the context of modern politics. Um, things were pretty awkward for the Northern Democrats during the Civil War, because of course the Northern Democrats were somewhat still politically aligned with the Southern Democrats, and the Southern Democrats are the Confederates during this period. So this is an electoral college map of the election of 1860. And the important thing to remember is that territories don't get to vote. So in the 1860 election, New Mexico was not getting to vote for president. So we see here that the red is the Republican Party, which is still the color that is informally associated with it. Um, you have the, de the Southern Democrats, who are the dominant party in most of the Deep South. Uh, but you see there are those three states that went for the Constitutional Union Party, Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Uh, two of those states did, in fact, end up joining the Confederacy. And Virginia ends up splitting into two states in 1863. That was the creation of the state of West Virginia. So it's a four-way split in the election, but you can see there that uh, that Abraham Lincoln got, looks like, 59% of the electoral vote, and that was enough for him to win. So needless to say, after being the party most responsible for starting a civil war that led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Americans, that you know, you'd probably want to keep a low pro profile. It did continue to be the party of the South, as well as of immigrants and workers in the North, particularly in Northern cities. Northern cities were dominated by democratic political machines. A political machine is an entity that exchanges favors for votes. And by receiving those votes, then they can perpetuate their political power. Uh, the most 
uh, notable political machine in America was Tammany Hall. Uh, and that was in New York City. And Tammany Hall continued to control politics into the 1950s. So we're talking 80 years or so. T Tammany Hall dominated New York. And the way that they worked was they would say, all right, um, if you guys vote the way that I want you to vote, then I'll do something nice for you or for your community, or I will make sure that you get a job. And this is how they leveraged immigrants as they came in, is they said to immigrants, here's what we need. We will give you a job. We will give you the connections you need to be successful. We might even help you get a place to live. And in exchange for that, you'll do what we ask. And especially once you're a citizen, you're going to vote the way that I want you to vote. And that way I can maintain my political power. But you also get something from it. You get a job or you get a place to live. And we also probably speak your language, literally speak your language. And that then also creates more opportunities for you. Um, the abolition of slavery uh, pushed a lot of Southern white people into the Democratic Party. Before the Civil War, a lot of rural white Southern people were against the Confederacy because they saw the Confederacy as being uh, representative of wealthy interests, wealthy interests down South. And they were opposed to that because the wealthy people of the South treated them very poorly. And so that is at least part of the reason why those rural Southern white people tended to remain loyal to the United States of America. But once slaves had been freed and now you have free black people in the South, that represents a threat to poor Southern white people. And so they actually then joined the Democratic Party in very large numbers. And in fact, it was those rural poor white people that were the ones that actually created the Ku Klux Klan. It was not wealthy lowland Southerners that created the KKK. Now in 1876, the presidential election, let's just call it a tie and not get into the nitty gritty because it's very confusing. But as a result of an agreement between the two political parties, the president is a Republican and the Republicans agree to end Reconstruction because that was a core demand of the Democrats is they wanted Reconstruction to be over. And so in exchange for the presidency, the Republicans agree to end Reconstruction. So looking at the Republican Party after the Civil War and into the early 20th century, well, for starters, only one president during that entire period was was a Democrat. The, the GOP, the Republican Party, was absolutely dominant at the national level. And it was still a pro-business party, but pro-business starts to look different after the Civil War when we get this new idea called laissez-faire. That's a French term, and it basically means hands off. And so laissez-faire in a political and economic context means that the the government is not going to have go, not going to interfere in matters of business. So business gets to do whatever it wants uh, under laissez-faire uh, economics, and that is indeed the way that the Republican Party operates, and that continues through the present day. Is the Republicans are very interested in letting business essentially do whatever it wants. The Republican Party was also an imperialistic party. The Democratic Party had been imperialistic before the war, looking to take, you know, capture Cuba and invade Mexico even further to create more territories for slavery. Uh, after the war, it is the Republican Party that becomes imperialistic. The Republican Party did champion the rights of former slaves and African Americans in the South, at least until there was a threat to their political power, namely the 1876 uh, presidential election. And so once Reconstruction is over, uh, African Americans in the South are are completely ignored by the Republican Party. Most 
uh, Southern blacks do continue to vote Republican because that's the party of Lincoln, at least into the 1930s. African Americans in the South do tend to vote for the Republicans, even though the Republicans are doing absolutely nothing for them. Uh, in the cities, though, in the North, it's the Republican Party that is the most progressive of the two parties, which seems counterintuitive because you have this pro-business party. But those progressives were very opposed to political corruption, and that political corruption is being perpetrated by these democratic political machines. The, the president that best captures the, the, the upside and the downside of the Republican Party during this period, though, is Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he is a reformer. He's a diplomat. He used to be a soldier. He's very much an imperialist. Uh, and he also advocated for some support for African-Americans. So he, he's a very contradictory uh, political figure. Uh, but that also kind of makes him fascinating. By modern standards, he's definitely a white supremacist. On the other hand, he's the first president, including Lincoln, to invite uh, free black people to come to the White House and have dinner with him and talk about the political status of black people in America. So, so, so very contradictory figure. Moving firmly into the 20th century, uh, we see that the evolution of the Democratic Party uh, and you have the pro-business Republicans who really kind of screw up the economy in the late 1920s, leading to the Great Depression. Uh, and then once the Great Depression is at its height, at its absolute worst, you have the Republican president continuing to put into place really stupid policies. So for an example of a really stupid policy that the Republicans put into practice at the beginning of the Great Depression is something that sounds a little familiar in the modern era, and that is a tariff. Uh, tariffs are a special kind of tax that are put on imports. Those tariffs are paid for by the American people, in America at least. So if you put a tariff on something that is coming in from Europe or coming in from China, that means that that product is now going to be more expensive in America. The other side of the tariff equation is you have the other country then put tariffs on your stuff. And so that's very bad for the economy. And that's the position and the policy that the Republicans tried to put into place. It didn't work. Uh, it made the situation far worse, and it opened the door for the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who is a cousin of uh, Theodore Roosevelt. So it's not a father-son thing. It's they're, they're more distantly related. But FDR puts together a super coalition, like the biggest political coalition in American history. You have Southern white people and Southern black people. You have Northern farmers, you have working class people who live in cities, you have immigrants. Um, so FDR did a massive amount of good for the country. He put together the New Deal and the New Deal was sort of a mixed bag, but ultimately uh, ended on, on the side of good. He also led America through World War II. The Democratic Party becomes the interventionist party. Uh, we see the Republican Party is in the late 19th century. It's the Republican Party that's imperialistic. Now the Republican Party is the isolationist. That's the opposite of expansionist or imperialistic. They're the isolationist party, and it's the Democrats under FDR that are the interventionist party. Now the Democratic Party does split after World War II on the issue of civil rights. FDR had stayed away from racial issues. He was not a great president on the issue of civil rights. Uh, his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, was very engaged with the African-American communities across America, but her husband really didn't do enough for Black Americans. Uh, after World War II, though, you have the Democratic president, Harry Truman, say that the Democratic Party is now the party of the civil rights movement, and they want to expand rights for Black Americans. And that was enough to drive the Southern Democrats temporarily out of the Democratic Party. Uh, and in 1948, they actually have a senator who splits entirely from the Democratic Party and creates a new party called the Dixiecrats. Uh, Dixie 
is the unofficial name of the Confederate battle flag. And so Dixie is a reference to the pre-Civil War era slave owning South, right? So it's a very clear message to Southern white people, hey, we're the ones that are not on your side, not those Northern Democrats or those Republicans. It is in fact the civil rights movement that completely realigns the political system in America. So we re still refer to it as the third party system because we are still in fact talking about the Democrats and the Republicans, but it's during the 1960s in which those two political parties flip their ideologies. So John F. Kennedy, who is the president at the beginning of the 1960s prior to his assassination, he claimed to support civil rights but as a Democrat, he could not win a presidential election without the Southern states. And so, yeah, he says he's for civil rights, but he, he you know, he kind of, he threads the needle to make sure that he can still get enough votes from the South to be able to win a presidential election. JFK only has one presidential election because of his assassination. And his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, who becomes president when he's assassinated, is a Texan. And when he was a Texan, when he was either a state representative in Texas or a vice president or a senator, he took the position that Texans took on the issue of civil rights, meaning that he was opposed to it. But to his credit, once he became the president of the United States of America, he felt that he was the president of all Americans, including black people. And therefore, as the president of the entire United States of America, he had to support civil rights. And he is the president who teams with black activists like the Reverend Martin Luther King to get the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Acts passed. And so it takes literally a hundred years after the end of the Civil War before Black Americans have things like the right to vote in all of the United States of America. They were prohibited effectively from voting in the Southern states. As a result of the passage of those laws, as a result of the mere act of saying Black people are equal to white people, that was enough for virtually all white Southerners to abandon the Democratic Party and switch over to the Republican Party, while at the same time, you have African Americans finally and completely abandoning the Republican Party to join the Democratic Party because it was the Democratic Party that supported civil rights. So you have this complete flip, and the flip is, is confirmed in the 1968 presidential election, because Richard Nixon, working with quite literally the founder of Fox News in the 1990s, a man named Roger Ailes. Roger Ailes tells Nixon that the way to win the presidency is to adopt what's called the Southern strategy, which is to go down South and be racist and to tell white Southerners that it's okay. We're going to talk about equality. We're going to talk about being one America, but you know the truth. The truth is that we're going to protect your racist ideology. The Republican Party will protect you so long as you always vote for us. So that cynical Southern strategy, sadly, has been utilized by every Republican presidential candidate from Richard Nixon to Donald Trump. The one difference between Donald Trump and all of the previous Republican candidates going all the way back to Richard Nixon is that he he started speaking directly out loud to racist people in America that he's got your back. Whereas other Republicans like George W. Bush and Ronald Reagan would sort of wink and nod at those racists while still pretending to uh, you know, be in favor of the rights of all Americans. In addition to the Southern strategy, one of the key events that changes the Republican Party is the rise of Christian conservatism, specifically political Christian conservatism. Uh, there were some Supreme Court decisions in the late 60s and early 70s having to do with legalizing abortion and, and pornography. Evangelical Christians who had 
really not involved themselves in politics began to actively support Republicans. That's also an outgrowth of the Southern strategy because a lot of those evangelical Christians live in the South. Another thing that happens in the 1970s is the rise of what's called televangelism. Televangelists are evangelical preachers who, instead of having a congregation just in a church somewhere, they have television programs. Um, and this, you know, this starts out with a good intent, which is sometimes there are people who are, you know, too old or too sick to be able to go to church. And so they can turn on their television and get a religious service on Sunday, which sounds really nice. Uh, what's also happening, though, is you're spreading this pro-Republican message on the economy. So things like, you know, low taxes and, you know, being more pro-business, uh, as well as on social policy. So that includes anti-abortion, that includes um, anti-LGBTQ policies that has to do with prayer in schools. Uh, and we also have uh, the, the gun rights movement that's coming into being during this period as well. Moving on to the modern Democratic Party, and we would say that this is the Democratic Party since about 1968, uh, there, there forms a division between center Democrats and liberal Democrats in the 1970s. And they both support civil rights, but the centrists are the, are the group of Democrats that are considerably more friendly to business than the liberal Democrats. Uh, the liberal Democrats are closer to, you know, an, an, an FDR style New Deal Democrat because they're not really uh, on the side of big business. They are much more likely to support government services for people uh, than center Democrats and certainly much more than Republicans. Uh, most of the electorate, well, a majority of the electorate are Democrats, but they don't vote as often as Republicans, and they are more divided as than Republicans are, at least prior to the Donald Trump presidency for the Republicans. Uh, the Democrats are, have been and continue to be very dominant in cities all across the country, including including major cities in the South, like Houston and Atlanta. The Democrats are also the preferred party of most people of color, uh, of the people in the country who are more educated and younger. And uh, the Democrats are pretty weak in rural areas, and that does give them a disadvantage with the Electoral College because rural areas uh, are more well represented in the Electoral College than more populous areas. So the Republican Party has gone through some massive changes since 2016, uh, a huge ideological shift. They have abandoned economic policies that they have supported for nearly 150 years, specifically those that are focused on business and small government and having low taxes. Um, the Republican Party had been using implicit racism since the 1960s to garner support, and now it is using explicit racism, anti-immigrant sentiment to uh, derive people to support Republicans. They are a much smaller political party than the Democratic Party is, and they have really only shrunk during the Trump era. Uh, the Republican Party that used to have a majority of white college educated people no longer has a majority of white college educated people, although it does have the overwhelming majority of white non-college educated people. The Republican Party is still very pro-gun and anti-abortion and pro-Christianity, but it is now also much more explicitly anti-immigrant than it ever was. For any faults that he may have had, George W. Bush was most certainly not opposed to immigration. He was a governor of Texas. He understands the importance of immigration to a healthy, open society. Um, and increasingly, what we're seeing, particularly just in the year 2020, that the Republican Party is becoming more and more of an authoritarian party. And that has great consequences for America going forward after the 2020 political presidential election. Thank you for listening to this presentation.